This is the first lecture for Friday, March 27th, for our ecology class. And so the purpose of this lecture is to finish talking about symbiosis, some other classifications of symbiosis, different types of symbiotic relationships. And then we'll start on looking at, at communities and how you view communities. There's a different number of communities out there, a lot of different communities, some very complex and sophisticated and others that have a lot fewer members, a lot fewer interactions. So that's what we're going to start with is how do you assess a community in the first place? And then after that, we'll look at some patterns of community diversity around the world. So as far as symbiosis, we looked at these different types of symbiotic relationships, parasitism and commensalism, and, and now we're talking about mutualism, these very interesting interactions where both parties benefit. Well, as you might imagine, if you have this mutualistic relationship that's going on for thousands of years, millions of years, then a lot of these relationships might get to the point where one organism can't survive without the other. They're that intertwined. And so there's other types of symbiotic relationships that, that aren't so intimately tied together. So there's obligate symbiotic relationships versus non-obligate. One, that they, they've gotten to the point where they can't live without each other. And the other one, not the case. So here we're looking at different types of mutualism. On Monday, we looked at trophic, and defensive, and dispersive mutualisms, mutualistic relationships. Well, let's look at this idea of obligate versus non-obligate. So some of these species, they have multiple other partners that they interact with. They have uh, some other dis things that disperse their propagules. They help them fertilize other plants or they help in dispersal or they help in food, those kind of things. But there's some that are obligate, that there's some one species that only gets its food from this other species or one species that only is dispersed by some other species. Or in an extreme case, You've got some photosynthetic organisms that are embedded in the tissues of some other organism. And so how do you, uh, you, you can't divorce yourself from that kind of association if they're actually incorporated into your tissues. A couple of examples of those are lichens. You have uh, lichens that are a combination of moss and fungi. So you've got this uh, algae that's photosynthetic, and you've got a fungi that's not photosynthetic. The fungi have to, they rely on other organisms for their energy, and yet they're found in the same tissues. So the photosynthetic organisms, they're deriving benefit from this association, from nutrients, and from a home. And the fungi get some of their energy and some of their nutrients from the photosynthetic algae. Similar type of relationship in coral, where you've got these little dinoflagellates, the zooxanthella, little photosynthetic organisms, single-celled organisms that are in the tissue of coral. Coral are multicellular animals. These animals have, have uh, this photosynthetic material incorporated into the tissues. The zooxanthella, the little Phytoplankton has a home, gets carbon, gets uh, nitrogen from the coral. The coral gets energy from the zooxanthella. And as I said, there's, there's millions of these little zooxanthella in the tissues of coral. That's a very intimate obligate, or, uh, interaction, obligate. Where there's other ones that, uh, you know, they've derived food from a couple of different sources or they are able to disperse 
a couple of different ways. Let's look at another example. The yucca moth and the yucca plant. This is the only fertilizer, the, the only disperser, the only thing that pollinates these plants is this moth. And the moth lays their eggs in this plant. The larvae hatch out. And it's the only food that this moth has. The only source of energy for this moth is this plant. The only source of, of dispersal, carrying pollen from one flower to the other, are these moths. So the moths are dependent on the plants for food. The plants are dependent on the moths for pollination. If the plants aren't pollinating, if one flower isn't pollinating another flower, carrying pollen, which is the, the plant equivalent of sperm, to other plants, other flowers, where there's eggs that are then fertilized by that pollen, then there's no pollination that takes place. So these plants aren't going to be able to reproduce. And since they rely on each other for food or for pollination, and they're the only ones that they get food from, but the only ones that pollinate them. That it's very, it's a very strict relationship. So the eggs hatch out. The eggs of the moths hatch out, and the larvae that are developing in this, they feed on the seeds. And there's only a certain amount that they're really allowed to feed. The so in other words, the plants are allowing the moths to feed on the seeds. They're agreeing to this, the, the, this uh, contract of, we'll give you 30% of our energy, basically 30% of our seeds, in exchange for you pollinating us. So that's the trade-off. The larva, if they start to feed on more seeds than about 30 percent then they these uh, seeds are aborted from the plant that they, they drop off and fall to the ground and so they're not receiving energy anymore from the plant and so the developing larvae don't have a source of energy which keeps in check the amount of energy that the moth larvae are taking from the plants. So now that's a very intimate obligate type of mutualism. Well if you have those types of relationships and those type of relationships are going on for millions of years then it's not surprising that one species that's involved in this interaction would affect the other species. And by affect them, I mean be a form of natural selection. So that some individuals within that population that have certain traits are selected over others. They survive more. They reproduce more. Their traits are passed on to their offspring. And those traits that are associated with some allele, some gene, become more common in the population. So earlier in the semester, we looked at coevolution as a mechanism of, as, as one pattern of evolution that organisms follow. There's a lot of organisms that have no demonstration of coevolution because they, they don't have the type of interactions, close associations with other species that would lead to coevolution. But a lot of them do. It's a fairly common thing. And if you look at a lot of predator prey relationships, there's a lot of predators that eat multiple prey. So one particular prey might not affect the, the genetic makeup of a predator or vice versa. A predator is uh, consuming this type of prey and this type of prey is eaten by 12 different predators. So those associations, they occur, but they're not so common. Parasitism, sometimes there's one species that's the parasite on one species of host. So the host is trying to combat this parasitism. The parasite is trying to get better at exploiting that host, and it's an arms race between the parasite and the, and the host. That's pretty common. 
And you've got competition, which is another type of interaction. And then you've got this mutualism where both species are benefiting. And so the more that you benefit, the more that you can take advantage of this other species, the better off you are. However, if it's a mutualistic relationship, then the other species has got a benefit as well. So let's look at some examples of coevolution. And first of all, just to remind you what coevolution is, this idea that one, one population is affecting the evolution of the other one, there is evolutionary changes, and by that I mean changes in the allele frequency in the population, that are occurring at the same time. Both species are being changed in terms of their genetic makeup of that population. Or in other words, both species are evolving. And they're evolving in response to one another. So there's a prey that's being affected by a predator. Or there's a parasite that's being affected by a host. Those type of things. There's a pollinator that's being affected by a plant. And so one of them change, changes. Some trait becomes more common. They have a longer uh, structure that's used for feeding or uh, they have stronger jaws or something like that than the, the, the host or the parasite or the predator or the prey responds by having its uh, a trait modified in response to the trait that was modified in the other organism that's involved in this relationship. This is evolution that we're talking about. So by definition, evolution means that there's a change in the genetic makeup. There's a change in the allele frequency of both populations. And this is what I was saying before. It's a, in a way, it's an arms race where one population changes. It affects the other population. The other population responds, and it's there's some trait or multiple traits that change in the other population. And now that population has changed with the other species, changes in response. And on and on it goes over millions of years, thousands of years. And uh, predator-prey, common. There's a lot of plants and herbivores that feed on them where there's co-evolution. Parasites and hosts, very common. And uh, also uh, pollinators. Very common. And so to just to remind you what we're talking about in terms of evolution with a genetic base up basis, allele frequency changing. And uh, so these things have gone on for a long time. It's not very easy to go out and look at this situation where, oh, look, you've got this hummingbird with long bill and it fits perfectly in this flower, it's an example of coevolution. Oh, look at this bird. It's got this curved bill that fits perfectly in this curved flower of this plant. Example of coevolution. So in order to study this, a lot of times what's done is you find these two, if there's a species that has a distribution where they are found in the same location as some species that they interact with closely. If you can find an instance where they're distributed in an area where this other participant isn't found, then you can compare the traits. You can compare the genetic makeup even, the allele frequency of those populations and see if there's uh, actual evidence in terms of uh, difference in the traits or difference in their genetic makeup that would really be a, a robust demonstration of coevolution having taken place. Well, let's look at some examples of plants, with these flowers that, that have a certain shape, a certain color, certain morphology that is uh, attracting predators, attracting pollinators. These plants usually have to give up something. They're giving up nectar, they're giving up pollen, they're giving up some kind of food for a pollinator and they want to advertise look if you come and and stick your beak or stick your part of your insect or crawl around in there to get some food then I'm gonna 
put this pollen on you, and you're going to go to another flower, and you're going to distribute that pollen around. Well, if you look in the flowers of plants and look at the variety, the diversity of of uh, these flowers are pretty, you know, we look at these, say, oh, look, that looks just like a bird. That looks like a tiger head. Look at these little fairies that are dancing around, those kind of plants. And look, there's a little uh, ballerina. Well, the plants aren't thinking that. Look, at here's some geese or ducks. And look, here's a little bird sitting on her nest, a little dove. And there's some little uh, baby things that are in a nest the, in their crib. Here's some little fairies dancing around. This looks like some kind of uh, scary creature mask in some horror film. There's another bird. Looks like a bird. Here's some little monkeys. There are flowers. Giraffe flowers. Another bird that's looking over something. Look at this. Uh, it's some kind of... Uh, it's holding out a little plate of food. Say, here, you want something to eat? So, if you think about, you know, these are very interesting to look at and, and relate to some other animal. Well, some animal. These are flowers. And speculate about how would that, but this is what we're doing. The purpose of showing those photos is to think about how would this come about? What are the selective factors that result in a flower looking like that? They have a certain shape, certain color, which contributes a certain attractiveness to the pollinators. And the way that they're designed is a effective in the pollinators getting pollen on them that there's food down in this tube but they have to stick their bill in there or stick their tongue in there or they have to crawl in there and while they're doing that then they get covered with pollen and they're taking that pollen to other plants other flowers to fertilize them there's that kind of relationship okay so that is a good way to end this discussion about symbiotic relationships. Now I just want to point out a couple more things for today and then we can stop is that it, the learning objectives for this course, this is from the syllabus, even under these unusual circumstances we're still doing our best to complete these learning objectives to accomplish these and we'll be able to do this What's really changing for this class is are, uh, the type of assessments that we have. As long as you're keeping up with the video lectures, you're doing these assignments, then you can learn the material. And that's really the goal, is that you're taking this class to learn certain things. And by the end of the semester, even with this online content, we can learn those things. So one of the next things in the goals of this course of the learning objectives was to describe diversity and mechanisms that affect diversity within communities. That's what we're going to focus our attention in, on now. Just to remind you, the way that we're looking at this is we're going through these different levels of ecology, different disciplines within ecology, organismal ecology we spent the first population ecology we looked at for a fair amount of time and then just recently we've moved on to community ecology and so there's a community of there's a population of of uh, prairie dogs and these prairie dogs are part of a community there's species of plants there's an owl there's a hawk there's other other uh, rodents there that's part of the community so that's where we are and we're going to look at two different aspects, two main aspects of community ecology. We've started off with these species interactions that you find in communities, mostly competition, predator-prey relationships, and then these symbiotic relationships. So there's interactions. That's one thing. Then there's the diversity of communities, the diversity that you find within communities, among communities around the world. 
And how do you define diversity in the first place? One person would say, this is a diverse community. Somebody else would say, no, this is a more diverse community. So that's what we're going to begin with, is how do you actually describe what diversity means in a community? And then when we've looked at some different ways of doing that, we'll change our focus to look at what explains why, if you travel around the world, you find some communities are more diverse than others. You find some patterns of diversity within communities. And we're going to call upon what we learned earlier in the semester, especially about the climate and some features that vary geographically, spatially, around the world. Some of those are going to be very good answers for explaining this community diversity. So that's what we're going to start with in the second lecture for this Friday, is looking at these different things and eventually getting at ha having an idea of how you quantify diversity or how you can look at one community and say, is that diverse or is that not very diverse? And then how you can compare those. So that's what we'll do in the second lecture.